Okay, so this is a project that's come out of my larger PhD research, um, which I haven't, um, I didn't necessarily envision in, at the beginning, but I think it's something that um, is important to me for figuring out how the site is kind of situated in contemporary memory. Um, so studying folklore can give insight into how archaeological sites are situated in contemporary social landscapes. And forms of folklore are both kind of the unofficial and non-authoritative narratives often that get circulated between person to person within a community. Um, and as such, um, they're integrally connected to power structures. Um, so during this presentation, I'll discuss ghost stories connected to tuberculosis sanatoriums in California um, and what these say about social memories of institutionalization. So folklore is often popularly associated with the past, either um, as beliefs or as practices which occurred in the past, or as traditions which were developed in the past um, and have survived into the present. Um, however, folklore traditions are also active and continue to be developed in the present, in the present in the form of um, either urban legends, um, other types of stories, memes, jokes, um, songs or sayings are just a few different types. Um, so for, it, folklore can be circulated in person, but um, the type that I'm looking at is from internet forums. Um, and as part of my project, I've kind of combined some of the, uh, I've been doing also archaeological survey on TB sanatorium site um, and archival research um, and oral histories. Um, and kind of the folklore connection, uh, collection kind of feeds into some of that. Um, but what I will talk about really mostly is going to be the folklore part of it. So in this presentation, I'll use examples of ghost stories from publicly accessible internet forums. Um, and I'll put them probably up on the slides rather than reading them out loud, because as I, I'll tell you about place and space, this isn't particularly the right ambience for sharing in this folklore tradition. Um, but, um, yeah. Okay. okay, so TP sanatoria originally were long-term residential hospitals, and sanatoria, the sanatorium treatment consisted of sunlight, rest, a special diet, high altitude, and fresh air. Um, they represented not only a particular type of treatment, but kind of an emergent concept of health um, and health practices around the built environment. <laughs> So TB sanatoriums mostly happened after germ theory, but before antibiotics. So the strategy at that point was generally to try to boost the immune system. Um, originally, they weren't meant to be quarantine or confinement, spaces of confinement, um, although that did happen in some cases later. Um, but the general assumption at that point was that everybody was exposed to TB, but that only some people would be, would develop it. Okay, so forms of folklore um, tend to be immersed in structures of power authority. Um, folklore generally consists of narratives that are both unofficial and unauthoritative, um, and they are often produced by a folk group, and all that can be defined differently depending on the type or the group of people. Um, so folklore traditions often have complicated relations with space, time, and the everyday, which are very relevant to archaeologists, but can also be difficult to interpret at times. Um, although ghost stories are usually tied to specific place and time, this tends to be fluid. For example, when I started the project, um, one of the stories, um, it had originally dated the, t the time that the content of the story took place to the early 1700s, but then it changed later to a time after which when the sanatorium was actually existed in 1918. So even the stories themselves can be fluid. Um, and in the ghost stories, people and places often recur in the present, um, and linear time gets kind of mixed up in interesting ways. Um, and But in a way, archaeologists also tend to converge the past with the present by searching for traces of the past in the present in the form of buildings 
artifacts and other forms of material culture. Um, so both oath stories and archaeological stories um, focus on aspects of the everyday, except ghost stories tend to be more ephemeral um, and less tangible things, so they tend to like footsteps or scents um, rather than midden deposits or broken dishes, but there's also this strong connection to the everyday. Um, also, although ghost stories are generally classified as legends um, and are usually tied to people and places, they don't always necessarily imply belief or specific ontology. Um, Tanglarini writes that one of the main differences be that has distinguished legends from folk tales and folklore um, is the believability of the narrative. Um, and believability is often established by tying the story to real people and places. Um, Adig, however, disputes the idea that folklore, belief, and legends should be distinguished based on belief and argues that researchers should not presume necessarily to know whether people telling the narratives or the audience actually believe them. Uh, Coven writes that about the truth and legends on British TV shows, The Most Haunted, um, and argues that episodes tend to actually invite um, viewers to engage in debates about the evidence and do not necessarily always try to convince the audience to believe or not to believe. Um, in addition, this can also be complicated by part of telling a ghost story um, often involves denying believing ghosts in the first place, um, So there, which is a good example of one of the stories from the Arequipa Sanatorium. So belief is also temporarily variable. Someone might believe in ghosts at night in an old building as a teenager, but not in the daylight the next very next day. Um, people participate in multiple belief, multiple belief systems, um, and these can be spatially, socially, and temporarily contextual. The idea that people participate in one ontology tends to align with kind of a static um, concept of the person who do, that doesn't necessarily take into account kind of the temporal and social context um, of that particular time. So studying contemporary folklore can highlight the fact that people will participate in multiple belief systems or in ontologies, and the folk traditions are also, um, can be the realm of um, contemporary culture as well, um, rather than kind of focus on past cultures um, or non-Western cultures. Um, the ghost stories also don't just begin and end with the narratives, but form a cycle of subjective experience, um, telling stories and interacting with the ghost storytellers. Um, so the ghost stories are um, often validated not only by how well the story te the teller tells it, but also um, it forms a cycle in which uh, the people who participate it and the story often um, engage in it like, will go to the place. Um, so the place and the space um, kind of forms a cycle. So reading ghost story before traveling to an, a sanatorium makes it more likely that people are going to experience um, that are, are going to feel like they're experiencing um, the place. And as a result, experiencing kind of a spooky place forms <coughs> a critical part of the story storytelling. Um, as entangled with the physical location and a sense of place. So intertextuality and extension therefore kind of play a role in the ghost story traditions in the U.S. since finding a place with the material culture and built environment which aligns with the motifs in the story um, and visiting that place are often part of the legend cycle. Um, intertextuality plays a role since the narrative influences the experience and subjective experiences then feed into new stories. And abstention is relevant because the role of material culture plays a part in the legend cycle. So stories like this one um, are not supported. Uh, so this one, the, the actual events in this isn't supported by other documentation as far as um, historic, like archival sources or newspapers. Um, and it didn't necessarily take place at the sanatorium in the sanatorium in the story. Um, but although 
I think his part, because although abuses have been taking place in other hospitals and institutions in the past, um, that I think rather than taking some of the stories literally, um, they may also be indicative of memories of institutionalization more generally. Um, sanatoriums tend to fit um, somewhere in between domestic spaces and institutions. Um, and in this presentation, I'm, uh, been ta I'll talk a little bit about kind of ideas of the uncanny um, and how that fits into ghost story sites. Um, the uncanny is the feeling that, kind of an eerie feeling, um, that something falls short of normalcy, um, or the feeling that something is concealed or more than it appears. And it also ties to personhood and animacy. Um, this story is one that kind of gets circulated um, in various different ways and different formats. Um, and um, although I'll, I'll just put this example up here, um, different variations feed into not only the sanatorium, but movies and um, other forms of pop culture. So to give an idea of kind of what some of these places look like, um, this one, the buildings are not there anymore. Um, but. So Lisa Gabbert writes that retreats and resorts are often popular places for ghost stories because these are both liminal spaces and third spaces um, or places which don't necessarily fit into one type of place. Um, Sanatoriums were midway between institutions and domestic spaces because people would live in these large dormitories together. They're also surrounded by landscaping and gardens and tended to evoke feelings of home, rural living, and morality. Um, uh, tuberculosis sanatoriums were liminal spaces because they're places where people would go when transitioning between identities. Um, and people would often enter the sanatorium without knowing for sure whether they were going to be able to return to their regular lives. So as a result, sanatoriums kind of get positioned between life and death. Um, they're also highly gendered spaces in a lot of ways. Um, so this uh, is an example um, of the Royal Del Val Sanatorium, um, which is a county run one and had both men and women and a large child, uh, children's ward. Um, the um, Alameda County, or the, or the Arequipa Sanatorium was for wage earning women and children. Um, and the Weimar Joint Sanitarium um, had mostly men, but at that time, there are twice as many, it's statistics showed that there are twice as many female patients, women with TB than men, um, which is one reason the Arequipa Sanatorium um, was built. So, and there's also been, and up through other sources, kind of a perception that um, women shouldn't go to the sanatorium or weren't allowed in there. So when, um, in one case, um, when a brother and sister, the brother went to the sanatorium, but the sister was cared at home. Um, Um, okay, so the uncanny is also linked to personhood and animacy. Potts and Shear write about the relationship about, between ghosts, machines, and the uncanny, and describe the uncanny as the disquieting or unpleasant feeling which people get in reaction to things which are midway between animate and inanimate. Um, Mori's, uh, Mashiro Mori's uncanny valley is the idea that people get a sudden emotional uncanny response to perceiving something which is in between a robot or a human. The uncanny valley also places uncanny and uneasiness on one side of the spectrum and animacy and empathy on the other, which could also explain why some ghost stories sometimes actually have, even though they're intended to relate, sometimes have a dehumanizing effect on people in the past. Um, Chen combines disability studies in queer theory and writes that people with sickness or disability are sometimes seen as less animate or less alive than people who are identified as able-bodied and healthy. Chen writes that this is problematic because personhood and rights are often associated with people uh, with perceptions of animacy. So ghost stories sometimes end up objectifying people 
And portraying people with disabilities is frightening, particularly in the cases that mix mental, uh, like asylums um, with TB sanatoriums, um, rather than doing the opposite and building empathy for real people's lives and lived experiences. Um, so I think it's important to mention also um, that some of this form of folklore can be problematic for the contemporary communities or um, landowners, especially since these places um, are now used as camps um, in some cases. So the practice of legend tripping or visiting the place where the legend was supposed to take place um, kind of goes hand in hand sometimes with vandalism or damage of the site. Um, so the Arroyo del Val Sanatorium, this one uh, originally was, was very heavily vandalized and that's part of the reason why the buildings were then, um, were then taken down. So many of the ghost stories feature failures <coughs> in machines or modernity, such as lights or inexplicably turning on and off, um, or a nearby freeway, which is suddenly devoid of cars, um, or flashlights turning off, or, and many are entangled with kind of anxieties of medicalization and scientific control over bodies. Um, so I think this is an example um, of one story that really uh, strongly um, uses motifs of machines. Um, and this is from the Arequipa Sanatorium, which was a sanatorium for women and children. So again, as these sanatoriums get kind of associated both as medicalized spaces and also in the domestic sphere, um, they kind of do a, justice, a juxtaposition um, of people with kind of, oh, of, of a gendered space that also gets just disposed with institutions, machines, and modernity. Um, so also certain groups of people appear more often in sanatorium stories. The sanatoria with the most ghost stories attached that I was able to identify was the Arequipa Sanatorium. And that was a private sanatorium for women and girls. And the Royal Del Val Sanatorium, which um, also is a county sanatorium with all ages, but also a large preventorium for children who are believed to be in danger of developing tuberculosis. Um, the Weimar Joint Sanitarium um, had over 400 patients um, and was much, it was arguably a lot larger than some of the others, um, and mainly men. And there are it's pretty much absent from the internet ghost story forums. Um, so um, it's also uh, women and children, and also a lot of the, the stories are also feature Native American um, patient, or Native American stories. So there's the um, kind of a story about India, the sanatorium being built on Indian burial ground or in a sacred space gets um, gets recirculated into the law of those. So that's another kind of strong theme that comes out of this. Um, so these stories may be reflective of what story, uh, I think also these stories are reflective of what storytellers consider plausible rather than necessarily real events. But within contemporary society, I think it's important to understand the institutional of children and the loss of rights um, is kind of a real, a, Thank you. Um, believable possibility, um, as is the control of female bodies by institutions. So children, child detention centers in the US border are just one example. Um, and all those stories sometimes promote stereotypes. Um, they also, uh, for instance, of people with disabilities or of um, indigenous uh, people, they also um, can reflect that the colonial history of California and kind of the appropriate discomfort over the appropriation of land or the destruction of sacred spaces through the development that continues to make the stories relevant. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, um, some of the most important part of the stories is, is what people consider plausible um, for the to, to people who tell them. 